And we're live. Good Look at boys. the boys. Tank looks nice and fresh there, mate. You got new new gear on there. Yeah, I've just got I've got a pair of jeans on today and a jumper. I don't know why. I just thought, you know what? Making an effort. I know, what? and I got ripped for that when I wore a shirt or something. Something yeah, nice. You looked, you looked a cunt. There's a big difference. <laughs> big <laughs> difference. Hey, I tell you what, that's a new record, a C-bomb within the first 20 seconds <laughs> of a podcast. <laughs> Jimbo, what's going on, lad? Lads, I think the wife's trying to poison me. I think I'm, uh, if I'm not here next, <laughs> if I'm not here next week, then uh, I'll be dead. We, uh, we have you ever heard of Hello Fresh? The Hello Fresh food. Yeah, where they I've been thinking of getting. I've been thinking of getting them. <clears throat> Millie and Sharon get it all the time. So Missy's ordered some ages ago at the <clears throat> when it was discounted or something, and then she can't she can't cancel it apparently. She doesn't know how, and so we get sent some random foods every other week or some mad stuff. We got sent some sausages with some, and it was like sausages with apples and like some mad f- fruit and vegetables. I was like, I'm not eating the fruit and vegetables. She's like, I'll make you some wedges with the sausages. I was like, right, sound. She <laughs> said she made me these wedges, right? And uh, I, I, I bit one. I was like, oh, it's like, what's that grit on it? She was like, oh, put your peri peri salt on. I'd I'd been to the shop to buy this peri peri salt that about an hour or no in the in the afternoon. I was like. It doesn't taste like peri peri salt, so I, I had some more. Start developing like, a tick, like <laughs> mate. It was dead gravelly. It was like it was like eating gravel. I was like, I can't eat these. She, she tried it. It's like she was like, oh, nothing wrong with it. I was like, did a bit. You could taste a bit, but I was like, fucking hell. Anyway, she, I, I just ate the sausages, left all the wedges because that's what she put the the peri peri salt on. A couple of days later, she came to. She went, that wasn't peri peri salt. I put on your, on your wedges. Oh. I was like, "What? What was it?" She was like, "This." <laughs> Stop. So read out like, that what that is, Jim, for the benefit so of the people that fresh, aren't watching on you. This is fresh bin powder that you put in the bin to stop it stinking. I was <laughs> like, "Do you know how what? You get to be funny, but how can she get that mixed up?" I have no idea. I was like, "Well, because <laughs> this is kept under the sink, and then yeah, the hold green, that up again there, so I can take a photo of it." Just the to... condiments are up. In a drawer miles away from there. So I was like, what how? She's like, Yeah, sorry. I was like, Well, no fucking wonder I've not been feeling great the last couple of days. <laughs> and it was proper gravelly. I was like, right, she's she's having me off. At least you come clean though. You know what I mean? At least you come clean. Powder on your, on your, on your fucking organs are clean. <laughs> <laughs> but it does tell- say it kills ninety nine point nine percent of germs. So I'm 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 riddled free anyway, so don't worry. Yeah. I'm all good. See, you're all right, mate, because you're a rodent. It hasn't killed Jim. <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> and Tank, you've got a gas leak potentially, so you could keel over at any moment during this podcast. Yeah, so just the gas fella said he's coming. Uh, I don't know. I can't remember what time. I don't know whether he said between one and two or two or three. So, okay. so if, if you dive me... off, I'm either drop dead or I've just gone to let him in. Okay, hopefully. Uh, I was waiting for Jimmy to say <laughs> to say that there. Uh, lads, football, right? And I have to say, so we've gone from last week where we I forgot to put it out on the Twitter page, to be honest, so it's my fault. We didn't get any uh, questions from listeners. They are back with a vengeance today. We've got some absolute belters, right? So we're going to talk, talk through some of the weekend's talking points uh, in the world of football, and then we're going to get straight into some of those cracking questions. And Tank, I'll come to you first, right? Because... Uh, you know, there's only really one place we can start. Arsenal have lost a little bit of ground in the title race. I would love to get your opinion on this because you've been very confident that Arsenal are going to get the job done. I don't think, and I've always said, I think City will will find a way to get it done. I think the pressure is starting to show a little bit with Arsenal now. What do you think? I think the lads at the back who's injured has, has been a huge, huge. Saliba. Yeah, I think it's been a huge, huge thing. But lads, you've got to, you've got to say. I can't believe how good they were against Liverpool in the first half. And the first 20 minutes against West Ham, it was like, it was unreal. Mm -hmm. It was absolutely unreal. They are a joy to watch. Let's just get that right. They are a joy to watch. I could sit there. It's like when you used to watch Liverpool, when Klopp had them full going. But this Arsenal side gives me the same vibes. And I sit there and just think, these are phenomenal. They're all a young bunch of kids. And the football they play, the way they play, is absolutely phenomenal. But the last couple of games, you just kind of think this the experience is kind of this is it's experience for me. But boys, nothing's changed my stance. I think they go to Man City and I think they get they get something at City. I just think they get something at City. 
Do you know, it's a it's a it's a tough one, Jim, because I'm looking at it and I can tell you don't agree there, Jim. But I I agree with Tank, and that was one of the first things that I was gonna say, right? So I really like this Arsenal team, I have to say, like neutral thinking Liverpool glasses off. Um I, I love the way they play football. I know Arteta gets passionate on the sideline, but I think football without a bit of passion is is, is a dull affair, so I, I don't mind it as such. Um I just and I think they've got some bloody good players and, and and I like the way they play. But if you're trying to win a title against a Manchester City team with Rob, Rob Holden at centre back, and I'm not yeah. trying to hang him out to dry it, do you know what I mean? Solid football and all that. But this is this is levels here. We're we're going for titles. We're not going for top four. Fantastic Barnet, Jim. I know you're a big oh, fan of his Barnet. Very jealous of the Barnet. But you're not going to win titles, I don't think, with Rob <laughs> Holden consistently playing at centre back for Arsenal. No, and they, that was my initial thought when he played against Liverpool. To be honest, I thought, "Oh my God, what's they're going to struggle here?" And then when they, you know, when they were two 0 up, I was thinking the same. But for me, they've been two 0 up the last two weeks now, and and have have given away and um, given away two gold leads. So for me, it's a bit of naivety and not being in these you know title positions and been challenging. They haven't challenged for the title for a long time, and like you say, they're a young team, so they've not got that experience of doing that. This is building blocks for Arsenal. I still don't think they win the league. I think the way City are playing, I think they would, and the, with the defensive frailties, if Rob Holding's come up against Haaland, he's gonna he's gonna be having nightmares. Um, well, I I think anyway for for the foreseeable when when they play. But yeah, like you say, building blocks for Arsenal. If they invest in the summer with people coming back, then yeah, they've got a, a great squad to to. You know, move forward and continue to challenge for titles. I just hope they can find that consistency, and it's not just a one season wonder because you're going to have Champions League to contend with. They're going to have you know cup competitions, injuries that they've been fairly um, fairly blessed with. Odegaard's gone on a <clears throat> decent run without injury when he's been you know known to have his injury problems. So. I still think City win the league. If I'm being honest, I think the way they're playing at the minute is just frightening. Tang, talk to us about title runnings, right? Because, I mean, we lived through this with as Liverpool fans and the weight of expectation of not having a Premier League title for all those times. And you can see the impact that it has on players, but supporters as well. You've been in title runnings with, with, with Forrest. How does it change the mentality? And particularly now when you're looking at the likes of a City, and I say this as a Liverpool fan, where trying to stay toe-to-toe with them over these recent years, a draw becomes a defeat. Like, let's be honest, there's no, there's no room for draws anymore. They've changed the landscape of football. When you were in title races back in the day, you'd take a point away from home sometimes and be like, look, take our medicine, get on with it, get 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 the next team back to our place and, and we kick on. Tell us about the, the mentality shift that happens when you get to those kind of latter stages of a season and every point really does matter. But it's, we had this with, with Forrest. I mean, we, we were winning the league at a counter with Forrest and... Um, Sunderland started the season really bad, and Sunderland had a right. We had an unbelievable side back then, but so did Sunderland. They had Phillips and Quinn up front. You know, remember old Kevin Ball in midfield and that old absolute animal in midfield. Was a good but Sunderland had a proper side as well. Uh, they, I think, they'd come down that season with Forest, but we started the season, you know. Flying, they were struggling like mad, but then Sunderland went on this mad run, lads. Seriously, they, we went away to Sunderland. I think one of the first games where we should have beat them at the Stadium of Light, and we got a draw. Um, in fact, no, I think we beat them at, at the Stadium of Light, and they just started coming in this run. They come to uh, the city ground and they beat us 3 2, but battered us as well. Like, um, so we were way clear, but we were just aware that Sunderland were now flying up the league, they were winning home and away, week in, week out. and I, re- I remember the Redden game. We played Redden and we needed to... On Redden were shite. Redden were, like, struggling near the foot of the table. And the pressure's, the pressure's immense. It, the pressure's are absolutely immense because the fans... Now, we were at Redden at home and we just needed to beat Redden to guarantee promotion. Not to win the league, just to guarantee promotion. One of the most intense games we played, we could, couldn't put two passes together. Redden fucking were battered us and these were bottom of the league like couldn't live with us that we we had players far superior than them and the atmosphere in the stadium was you could feel it I could sense the tension horrible and the pressure's just all on you and you're thinking fuck me and Chris Bart Williams scored like because he was a good player the Bartman and he just done this turn in a box and like half scuffed the left footed shot in the bottom corner and I swear to God I've never come across like a relief just seemed to come off you the whole stadium erupts 
And this is probably 10 times worse what this Arsenal side's going through because this is for the Premier League title and these are all young boys. We had experienced internationals, Steve Stone, Kevin Campbell, Pierre Van Oudon, Colin Cooper. You know, we had Scott Gemmell, international football players who'd been there and done it. Now, this Arsenal side's all a young side and the pressure's, the pressure's like horrendous and this is where City does have the advantage, but... I've just got a feeling Arsenal are going to go and do something with the uh, Etihad. I mean, Jimmy's laughing there, but listen, the, Arsenal's been the best side this season for me by country man. Man City haven't been a Man City of the two, three seasons ago. No one. I, I, I think they've. I think yeah. I think at the start of the season, but I think they've started. They've made that unbelievable now. They've found how to work to Holland. That pass from De Bruyne into Holland for his second goal on Sunday is the epitome of. Of where they've come from to where, or where they were to where they are now. At the start of the season, De Bruyne doesn't play that pass. He'll recycle it out to the wing, but he's getting it straight into his feet. Great first touch from Haaland. That they're just the firing all. I can't see past them. I think that win at Bayern, as long as they get through the Champions League with no scrape. If they lose that Champions League game, then yeah, my money will go on Arsenal. But I still think it's City's to lose. It's funny because we'll, we'll come on to City now, and, and one thing that's probably been spoken about a little bit now off the back of Arsenal's results tank is you've got to look at the fixtures, right? And Arsenal have got Southampton at home next. Then they go away to City, Chelsea at home, Newcastle away, Brighton, who I've been massively impressed with, and we'll, we'll come on to them in a little bit and at, at home and then Forest away. So it's not, it's not a great set of fixtures. And you, you're looking at this and like, like Jimmy says there, I think City have really gone up. A level and it, it does. You said it a, f- a few episodes ago. It's all going to come down to that that big game at the Etihad, and 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 you fancy Arsenal to to cause them problems. I just think City. I think you can get at City. I know they're unbelievable going forward, but you you can get at this. That City back four or back five. It's not great, lads. Let's get that right. It's not great. I mean, you know, they can see chances and the the you know they can see goals where when Liverpool and City were going at a toe to toe, not only with the steamrolling teams, but they very rarely can see the goals neither. They were so solid and you kind of like there was no chinks in the arm. And now for me there is. The, the, Man City give up chances, you know. Now Liverpool give up more chances. It, it's like Liverpool is just a charity now. You, you can score against Liverpool whenever you feel like they're like they're such a lovely side that they'll give you a goal when you want. But City, City give you chances and look, this Arsenal side, the way they play and, and I know that they've, they've give up, a, but anything can happen at Anfield like that. We know that anything can happen. You've got a West Ham side, which is a local derby and they're fighting for the lives. And I mean, let's get it right. He should have been put to bed long, long before that. And I just think if this Arsenal side gets hold of City and then it all depends. I mean, when's the centre-half back? Is he not back? Is he out for a while then? No, I think he's, he is due to be back. I'm not sure. Uh, I don't think he's out for the season. Like, he's due to be back. If he, well, if he's back and he plays against Man City, I think Arsenal gets something with City. But you know the, the problem is, as you've just said, Rob Olden against Haaland, it's like it's like Jimmy trying to take me on an RP. It won't happen. See, the, the funny thing is, you, you said it there, with the, with the recovery pace of Saliba, I think that's the... Uh, I'm just having a look now, we're not uh, West Ham... Okay, uh, hopefully be available again within the next few weeks. So uh, potentially you'd be they're thinking they've got Wednesday, that city game. They've got they'll have that city game in mind to try and throw we'll them in. Southampton next. Uh, yeah, Southampton. Southampton. Oh, is it? Yeah. Yeah. Is it next Wednesday? Yeah, next Wednesday. So. Week on Wednesday. Um, but I want to come to you on City, Jim, because and I don't know where you got this from because like I know we argue all the time, but you got this one wrong. I've always loved Jack Grealish, so I don't know. Yeah. You you think that I. Thought maybe, like maybe something. with some of the we, tank was saying, but yeah, we did we disagree on a lot of things, but Grealish isn't one of them. And I want to come to you on on City, right? Because, like you said there, I I do think that they seem they seem different now. Their tails are up. Uh, I was I have to be totally honest. I got the Grealish thing totally wrong, right? I, I he was my favourite non Liverpool player prior to signing for City. I was worried that Pep was gonna take the Grealish out of them, if that makes sense, nearly remove his creativity and just make him another uh, uh, link in, in the city chain. Couldn't have been more wrong, to be honest. Uh, I, you know, it didn't look great for Jack Grealish for a long time, but like with Pep, and you've seen it with Klopp, if players don't adjust and he, and he gives them that time to learn the way that they play, Jack Grealish looks like a player transformed for me, going in both directions. So it's not just as he, as he impact in the game going forward, which we know he can. Yeah. I think he's more, I don't want to say clinical, but 
there's a lot less wastage from him, I, I feel now. And then he's also doing an unbelievable job the opposite way. You've got to give, you know, we all know that Pep's an unbelievable coach, but he's, he's doing great things with him. And now you're seeing the evolution of John Stones in, in, in kind of his new role. They're building momentum at the right time. I think they found a system that is absolutely flying for them with John Stones pushing into midfield. You've got um, either Diaz and uh, well, Walker played on the weekend, but I don't think Walker fits into into Pep's system anymore. He's even said that he can't play with either Ake or, or on the left and, and Grealish and Mares doing the, the hard work up and down So and then f- firing into Haaland. So I think they found the system that is working fantastically well for them. And I always knew that, well, you know, I always said Jack Grealish would always take a time. Thierry Henry went from Arsenal as probably one of the best players in the world to Barcelona and struggled with how Pep wanted him to play. He tells a story where Pep dragged him off at half-time because he went to he went into an area that Pep didn't want him to go in and he dragged him. So if someone like Thierry Henry was struggling to fit into Pep's system, then Jack Grealish would, would do the same. And now what you're seeing is when, when he's had that confidence back into him, you're seeing... A sort of Jack Grealish 2.0 from Villa. He's confident. What I like about him, he just gets the ball, he protects it, he gets his body in. That's why he gets so many fouls. But he's not getting fouled at the minute because he's he's getting past the player and continuing. He, he seems to, go, to be driving more now. To drive, yeah. yeah. But he does it from the left and he drives inside now, inside, and he's getting. I think he's got. He's up there with. Um, Watkins and Haaland with goals and assists in, in, since the World Cup. So he's he's been absolutely fantastic. And there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of, and this is why I don't want to condemn Anthony so early, is that he's got to get used to the system. Give him a season or two. And if he's still as awful as he has been, then yeah. But, you know, Grealish was condemned a lot because of the size of the transfer. You know, no goals in games. And, what, or, you know, he was, he was struggling for goals in games. So, yeah, fair play to Pep. And to be fair, fair play to Jack Grealish. He's obviously put in the hard work and been doing what Pep's telling him to do and, and they're all getting results. Tank, it's, it's funny, right? Because we had a, a full full podcast on Haaland and how City aren't as a Someone said the worst was uh, Haaland, just F <laughs> Yeah, yeah so, and, and look, I, I still think there is elements of City were more difficult to play against in previous setups with flying wingers. I, I still do personally stand by that, but there's one thing that we can't shy away from is that Erling Haaland is an absolute freak of nature. I'm going to read you out some stats here, right? Because it blew me away. Because I do sometimes do a little bit of research for these things. Listen to this, right? So Her- Haaland now has 32 goals in his first 28 Premier League appearances. He's now drawn level with Mah- uh, Mohamed Salah's record of 32 goals in 38 games. 30, he's got th- so 32 goals is better than Sergio Aguero's return, total return in any of his 10 Premier League campaigns. 32 goals is better than Wayne Rooney's total returns in any of his 16 Premier League campaigns. And then th- there are now only ever two better goal scoring Premier League seasons than Haaland's uh, uncompleted debut campaign this far. And that was with Shearer 34 and Andy Cole 34. So you'd be confident that he's going to, to surpass, two, surpass those. I think he's. Go on, Jim. I was just going to say, there's, there's a stat around if he gets to 50 goals in a, in a year, calendar year, or some, <laughs> something along them lines that he's close to getting. He'd be the first person to do that as well. Yeah, he's, he's, a, he's a machine tank. I mean, how do we try and put these numbers into context? Because, no, let's be honest, we haven't seen anything like this before. No, it's just that he's... he's I've said this in the podcast before. If you watch, if you watch him... Take his, it's, it's, it's a, it sounds a mad statement. Take his goals away, you watch him and you just think, fuck me, what's this all about with him? But he's just an absolute goal machine. But this takes me back to, you get what you pay for for this quality. So Haaland is an absolute freak and he could pretty, if he could stay fit. I've seen what Pep was saying the other day that they have to manage him as well because he missed a lot of games. He always has done. He's missed 33, and I think it's an average of 33% of games for every season he's played. But Pep says that they manage him and he doesn't train sometimes and he's always in a physio and he's always getting treatment. And 
he's got to take massive, massive credit for that. His stats are unbelievable. But then that takes me back to you, you boys waxing lyric about the hundred million pound man Jack Grealish. I and knew he didn't want to let that go. I can no, see in his face. Yeah, he's wrong. A phenomenal season. He's the greatest thing since fucking whoever parted the seas. <laughs> go fuck yourselves. That'd be Moses. A hundred million flop, and he'll remain a hundred million flop. Nine Champions League games this season. No goals, no assists. Wonderful from Jack Grealish. 24 Premier League starts this season. Five goals, six assists. What's amazing about that, boys? Well, wax and lyrics about Haaland with his 32 goals, you cost 65 million. We're saying Mo Salah's had a fucking disaster. He's had about 40 goal involvements of the season. Jack Grealish. Five goals, six assists, and we're sitting on a podcast saying he's wonderful. The revolution of Jack Grealish, hundred million boys, a hundred yeah, million. You, you know, you know as well as I do, Tank. These things take time, right? And but you, you know. don't get time, Jamie's a hundred million pound player. That's one thing you don't get. Paul Popkins was was the biggest flop in world football because and his stats every season were piss all over Jack Grealish. By the way, Paul Popper to get you double goals and double assists every season. He was a hundred million pound player. He was considered a flop. So. Why is he now considered this five Premier League goals for a hundred million attacking player? That's I'm not getting excited over that, boys. I'm sorry. Yeah, but everyone knows that he struggled at the start, didn't he? You're the stat man. You are the stat man. So it's since I am the stat man, yeah. And I'm and and if that's but don't if say that's before what, the World Cup. Don't say after the World Cup because football. I am was, say before the World and after the World Cup. After the World Cup, Jack Grealish has been one World of the Cup. most informed players since coming back from the World Cup, up there with Haaland and Ollie Watkins. Sorry. So what okay, more do. do you want him to do? What more? Well, what more do you want, you want him to do? Goals of season. You just so, said he's up there with Ollie Watkins, who scored in nine successive Premier League games. Yeah, Ollie Watkins is second behind Haaland, and you said Haaland makes this Man City team worse. I didn't say it makes it worse, so that's another load you of bullshit. You probably put you that did. on the WhatsApp group and on Twitter <laughs> as well now. What I said to you is the Man City team is is easy to play against with Haaland in the side because they don't manipulate the ball as they do. But let's not take away from your stat that he's the greatest thing since since Jesus Christ with five goals, six assists this season. I never said Jesus Christ fuck. is that great, to be fair. He is an absolute fuck. <laughs> I can't believe that Victor yeah. Moses parted the Red Sea as well. To to try and get in the middle of you both, right? What I yeah. would say is... Can you oh, see that Jack Grealish stats? It actually says underneath it, he's shit. 100 million, <laughs> boys. 100 million. I, I would say that, like Jimmy, I, I'm with Jimmy on this one, right? I think it's taken him time to learn the way Pep wants to play. I think everybody can see, and I agree with you, Tank, for 100 million, you should be hitting the ground running, right? Jamie, can I just interrupt you? Because I seen yeah. something the other day. Someone posted about old Klopp signing. I nearly commented. And it's a massive Liverpool account. How many goals has Nunes got this season? Is it 14 in all competitions? Yeah, there are thereabouts. Yeah. yeah. Loads of loads of assists. Who would you rather have on your side? In Liverpool side? No, in a Klopp you... Liverpool side? I don't think it should matter, mate. If you've got one who's going to score you 14 goals and give you five or six assists, or you've got one who's going to score five goals. Football, football is about goals. It doesn't matter about all his bollocks. It's goals and output. Jack Green is goals and output. Hang on. And nowhere when near. I talk around Harvey Elliott, goals and oh, output. Oh, don't bring Elliott yeah, again. Or again. Fuck it. Oh, it is one way or another, you fuckers. Like, oh, you I'll, just, I'll, you I've never mentioned tune, that. Yeah, yeah. Like, right, let's, let's make this tune up about Jack Grealish, but no one else can have this tune. because Harvey Elliott's a 19-year-old kid, mate, who's, who's 19 years of age. They've paid 100 million for the 26, supposedly finished article. Shove it up your ass. It's all about pathetic. goals and assists. <laughs> I was on your team here, Jim. I was on your no, team. I know, but there. still, like. That's his argument. Every time we mention a player, he goes to Harvey Elliott. It's like you hate Harvey Elliott. No, it's not about goals and assists. You can you can do a it's side pass and it doesn't assists. count. It's not about goals and assists. 100 you million. Just it is. You, you just literally said it is. No, I'm saying to you, you've just said that's not about goals and assists. You've got a hundred million pound player, and you're waxing lyrics saying it's the, the listen, he's the new he's the new beginning. 
<laughs> five <laughs> goals. What we're saying is he's playing five well. Goals. <laughs> no five saying, goals. You're just putting words into people's mouths. Jack really is informed. Off the list That's all anyone said. 26 nope. Premier League games, five goals. But you two are sounding here going, this, oh, boys, it's took them time. It's peps this. Oh, in Nunes, 23 Premier League ga- got games, eight goals, three more as a main striker. Who? Nunes, but he's Nunes the next best play. thing. He doesn't start many. No, <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> it's, it's, not still more, it's still more than Jack Grealish. Yeah, as a striker. Less games and more goals, and that's your argument. As a striker? He's played less games and more goals, so... Put that I, one to my, that. My, my argument here would be, I think there's been a distinct change in A, City, and B, Grealish. And I think if we're having this conversation next season, I don't think we're able to... And I think Tank makes a point. For 100 million, you want him to settle I quicker. But I also doesn't... think... I Hold on, Jim. I also think that right. Pep is, a, is an awkward... He's an awkward customer, as in he's got a like you said it perfect example before Thierry Henry. It's going to take time. It's it's a different way of playing football altogether, particularly if you're confined to specific zones. And Grealish at Villa was always a free spirit. He was basically able to go wherever he wanted. So it's a big big jolt for him. What I would say is, I I think we're now starting to see as, as you said, Jack Grealish 2.0. Be interesting to have this conversation next season because I think he'll continue on this vein of form. Now you know yourself, Tank. Confidence is everything in football. It's not his fault that he was bought for 100 million, but I think he's now starting to hold the weight of the 100 million tag a little bit better at City. Would you agree with that, or are you just not having him? There's been a, there's been a case of not having him. I like Jack Grealish as a footballer. Oh, I've it sounds like that. it, lad. I like him as a footballer. I'm not, I'm not into all you of this. You like I'm me not, next as a person. I, I'm not having all of this where everyone's waxing lyrics over him. He's never scored more than 10 goals in a season, and that's including playing championship football for Villa. So for me, boys, that's not a hundred million pound player. You want a hundred million pound player? We're talking about Jude Bellingham as a hundred million pound player. Now we he's like streets and levels ahead of what Grealish could ever want to be or dream about being and potential wise. But lads, I'm sorry, but if I'm paying a hundred million pound for a an, an attacker, and it's okay saying about Thierry Henry, Thierry Henry still scored over twenty goals in Barcelona that season, and it took him time to adapt. He still scored over twenty goals. Jack Grealish will never score 20 goals as long as he's got a hole in his ass. Never. I'm just write that down. So, so I want to stay with you, Tank, for because I want to go on to the relegation battle. And I was actually going to, I wanted to do a little bit on, on Brighton and Villa because I've actually been massively impressed at the job that they're doing. But because we've got so many good questions in from the listeners, I want to I want to get to those. So maybe we'll set, save Villa and Brighton for, for, for the next one, right? But relegation battle, I have to... I had to come straight to you, Tank, because obviously Forrest are bang in the middle of it at the moment. And we've had a couple of listeners come in with questions or comments or just generally being pissed off around the Harry Maguire handball. Now, whilst I don't think many people are going to sit here and say, you know, the expectation was for Forrest to do a number on Man United. I think everybody would, look, if you got a point from that game, you, you take it, you move on. It's not going to be that, you know, the, the relegation battle isn't going to be decided with games against Man United. But when you see something like that happen, which for me happened at such a pivotal moment in the game and potentially another referee could give it as a second yellow card, that changes that game completely. Explain to me how that's not a penalty. But you can't explain it. And this is, this is why we, the, the, the people who are running VA now, VA are, they need to go because it, now it's because it is actually becoming a joke. I was sat there and I was actually, I just was laughing. I was like, how can that not be? How can that not be a penalty? His arms in an unnatural position, no matter what you say, his arms there and it's, it's fell on his arm. So it's going to be another one of them with the Fulham one where you're just going to get a written apology, but it doesn't matter. I've played at the city grounds for eight or nine years of my career. And once them fans are on your side and they're, it turns into a cauldron. So if they go 1-0 up with the penalty against United, it becomes a completely different game. It becomes a cauldron of noise and every tackle will get a cheer, every block tackle, every good bit of play, everything, the whole stadium goes up to levels where other teams struggle. We've seen it with Liverpool. Liverpool went there and struggled. Once they went 1-0 up, it's a difficult place to be. For me, lads, it's bored. This is now boarding on. And I think Jimmy was touching on this when he said a couple of weeks back where it's bored board now on cheating. It's got to be. There was it a lot of comments, be. Tank, about top six conspiracy theories with VAR. But th- for me, that's got to be because you look at the Tottenham one now against Brighton. And how can any man who's got 
all woman, all them, if you want to go down that route. Oh, fuck's sake. Nice tank. Good lad. How can anyone watch that uh, Brighton one and think, yeah, that's not a penalty, that. It's a fucking stonewall penalty. How can anyone who knows the rules see that Harry Maguire on ball and just think, yeah, cool, nothing to see here. On you go, carry on. So it's got to be some sort of conspiracy or this cheating going somewhere along the line because these decisions can't be this bad and this wrong on a regular basis, by the way. It's not just them two incidents. This has been since three years since we've been talking about it. It's funny, it's funny that the one thing that I'm delighted that I haven't seen today because I've been uh, been busy is Dermot Gallagher trying to explain why that wasn't a penalty because if you ever want, like, my idea of hell is just put me in front of Dermot Gallagher trying to explain why his mates haven't made mistakes and I'll, that's it, I'm done, right? I've, I've seen enough. I'll tell you anything you want to know. Just make me not watch this shite any longer. Jim, is it a, is it a straight shootout between Forrest and Everton, do you think, now with how it's all shaping up at the bottom? Because I'll be honest, a couple of teams now are starting to you know, see Wolves, you see uh, Bournemouth getting, getting a big result. Teams are starting to win games now, and it, and it kind of seems, unfortunately, for, for in Forest's case, but 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 not so much in Everton. Sorry, Everton fans, uh, that that they're obviously starting to struggle. Yeah, there's there's three in it for me. I think Everton, Forest, and Leicester. I think Leicester could be dragged into this. You know, I don't think that's an inspirational appointment in Dean Smith and John Terry. Well, hold on, Jim. Have you looked at the league table, lad? Bit of research. Yeah, Leicester a second care. bottom. Leicester second bottom, are they all right? Well, yeah. Leicester second bottom on 25, Southampton bottom on 23, Forest 27, third bottom, Everton. I still, uh, think, uh, I still, I still think Leeds could be dragged into it. I, th- I assume they're just above Everton. or Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, my, my father-in-law and brother-in-law went to the Everton game on the weekend and said it was absolutely awful. Like uh, The only thing that goes in Forest's favour at the minute would be the form of Kalor Navas because he was unbelievable in a defeat yesterday. Some of the saves he was pulling off was, you know, world class saves. That one off Fernandez that he tipped onto the bar. That to me would be the only thing because I think everyone else is struggling is defensively. Forest are two, but if you got Navas who could maybe put in another performance like that against a team in and around them, and they sneak a win. I don't, I don't see the many wins coming for any of them three teams, whether it's Leeds, Leicester, Forest, or uh, Everton. Jimmy, so think- let me read Everton's games on for you here, and just tell me where you because I'm, I'm, I thought I was actually thinking I think Everton are going to be all right. I've just yeah. been looking at their games, mate. It's and I school, don't, they? I don't shit, see yeah. where the wins coming. You know, I'm being honest. They've got Crystal Palace away on Saturday. You're flying. You've got Newcastle at home. This for me, and I think this is where Leicester get out of the shit because Leicester do have quality. Then you've got Leicester away, you've got Brighton away, Man City at home, Wolves away, and Bournemouth at home. I don't, I can't see. There's, I'm not too the sure. The only one could there, be you know, Bournemouth whatever. last game of the season if they're safe and on the beats. You never know, do you? But um, I can't. The issue with Everton, and I've said it all along, is they've never been able to score goals. They might have dice at the, you know, who'd be able to keep it down, you know, keep the goals to a minimum. But if you can't score, you're never going to win, are you? So that's been their, that's been their serious issues. And and Forest have got goals in them. So. I do think it's a straight shoot. At Leeds have got goals in, but they can't defend for the life of them. So if if you know, they might win five four or against one team, but yeah, I think I think it's going to come down to the games against sort of your Crystal Palaces if they get safe and then they're on the beach. But to be fair, lads, Roy Hodgson since coming back, what he's just <laughs> absolutely really? took the shackles off Elise, uh, Elise and uh, Eze. So Scary. they're. They're fucking, you know, don't forget you got Zaha to come into the frame there as well. So if you put Zaha down the middle, um, just let them front free run right and and put everyone else behind the ball. They'll, they'll be they'll be sound. So yeah, it's gonna be. It's gonna, I'll be honest. I'm more excited. Well, I was more excited about the relegation battle to the to the. I've got no, there's no skin in the game at the title, but I think I think either way it's gonna be. So hold on, you've got no skin in the game in the title. Does that mean you've got a skin in the game in the relegation battle? Or like, what, what are you saying there? Who's your team? 
Chelsea like Chelsea yeah. in relegation <laughs> battle. <laughs> they nearly are. <laughs> um, right, lads. So I want to get to these listeners' questions because we've got some belters, right? Uh, and I also have to pick my daughter up soon. So uh, we'll get these r- rattled through uh, fairly handily, right? So, um, you know, we caused a bit of a stir or Jimmy caused a bit of a stir around old Roy Keane and his comments around Andy Robertson and his baby comments. Your baby, your baby. I don't know oh, why mate, you're from getting, all we of a sudden. <laughs> we were getting pelters on Twitter, weren't we? After had two Irish blokes. Oh, they weren't happy, yeah. And uh, yeah, no, look, it was a divisive one, right? And, and Andrew um, got in touch to, to build on this a little bit because he wanted to know, and get our opinion around Roy Keane in particular, because there's there's one event that sticks with him. <clears throat> excuse me, sticks with him as as something where he called his character into question, and the fact that he's then calling people babies and all this type of stuff that that's that's where the link comes from, right? So, Tank Andrew wants to know and get your opinion on the issues around Saipan and Roy Keane leaving the World Cup squad as a result of. Um, an issue with the manager, an issue with the the, the facilities, so, the yeah. training setup, the travel arrangements, basically the, the the lack of professionalism, for want of a better uh, phrase, around the the Irish national team in the 2002 World Cup. This then came to uh, come to a, a figurehead or, or came to a head when he had a clash with Mick McCarthy. Mick McCarthy then basically told him that he faked an injury and blah blah blah, and then he he ended up going home. Andrew wants to know, what was your opinion on that event? Because you've been in dressing rooms, and I think it's fair to say, Jim, to be fair, having known him for so long, is quite a chill dude, to be honest. I don't really see Jim um, digging his heels in too much around stuff. Whereas I can be a temperamental bollocks. I I think you could potentially be a temperamental bollocks when you need to be tank, I think it's fair to say. Um, And as men sometimes... You'll walk away from something on a point of principle. I know I've done done it. Even if every part of my body has wanted me to do a certain thing, something may have been said or done, and I'll bite down on my gum shield and walk the opposite direction because it just that's the way I'm built. Sometimes, what do you what did you make of that instance? And and having been in dressing rooms and had arguments with managers, if Gary Megson's t- caught saying that you faked an injury, I would guess that you you might be uh, not too fond of that approach. But the whole thing with the Keane and the World Cup stuff is like it's, the problem with the the Irish national side. And I think I think every every Irish man and woman will agree that it, it, it was run a bit like the dog and duck. I don't think the but I don't think the funding was there. That was the other issue. I don't think the funding was there. So it's a bit of a, it's, it's a bit of a difference. Like Roy Keane is at the the biggest club in the biggest world club. where everything's perfect, everything's right because the standard was set by a manager who demanded that and. You know, when when you've got everything right as a manager, then you players have no excuses. So you can't go to the man and say, well, this, 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 this. And he's like, well, no, actually, this, this, this is right. It's fucking you. So you need to improve. Now, I think everyone knows that they are, the standards of the Irish, the FA, and what, uh, the, the budget and the funding they have was bad, was really bad. But... Does that mean that Roy Keane was, was right? No, because it was the same standards when he was in the World Cup qualification and the other tournaments prior. Just because it was going to the World Cup then, it didn't mean that the Irish were just going to go, oh, this is great, now we're going to get the best of everything because that's that's the way he was run. So I disagree with what Roy Keane done, but I understand why he done it. But he should Would have you done have done it? Because Andrew's issue... It. Well, Andrew's issue was you never turn your back on your country. Is, is, is the line that he said to me. What would you have done in that situation, Tank? I don't think it's a case of turning your back into your country. You're turning your back on what you believe in. It's like, if if certain standards were met when I was playing football and, like, you, you know, you're getting dog and duck treatments, but then I would be one of them players who'd say, what the fuck's going on here? Why are we there? What? Why? You know, this isn't right. We've got a big game here. We should be, we should have the best of what we've got. If that's what we are, we had anyway. But as I say, the argument is that the Irish FA never never funded the best of anything. But there's talks about the balls and everything with Ireland at the time, and they were like fucking Sunday League footballs. And when you're in the league player at Roy Keane, and, and you know, let's not forget, lads, he was probably the greatest midfielder in world football around then. To be going from Man United, where you've got the best of every even equipment, and then you're going to the dog and duck, it's difficult to to bite your tongue. So. It's a, it's a touchy one for me. I understand fully why he done it, but I, I probably wouldn't do it. Be, but, you know, who am I to tell Roy Keane what to do? <laughs> Jimbo? 
I'm the same. I think I've seen you walk off the pitch once. I, I mean, that I made could... me mad. That made me mad. Actually, that was probably the most mad I've ever been with you. But it's different, fair. isn't it? I mean, like Tank said, this is representing your country. He's representing teams, and is representing your country. It should be an honour to represent your country. And the the thing that sticks in my mind is Ireland. Very, you know, they didn't. They don't qualify for World Cups. So this is this is the issue for me. Is Roy Keane shot himself in the foot because he's? I don't think he played for Ireland in the World Cup after that. I'm not quite sure if he played before. Maybe I don't know if that was his only opportunity, but there's a highly there's a high probability that it was. So I can understand him being frustrated that things aren't great. But it's not just Roy Keane FC. You've got another 25 blokes there that he's. I think was it? I assume he, he was a captain, wasn't he? He was a captain of that team, so he needs to then just grin and bear it and go look in private with with. I think he played uh, in ninety four. Just checking. Yeah. I think he played in ninety four. Played in ninety four. Yeah. But either way, like you, you don't. It's not like you play. It's not like the Champions League that you you know you're guaranteed to play every year. So he's played one. He should want to play again. Um, so he, in private, he should be taking it up with the management and doing what he needed to do. Um, and then, in, you know, in the team, he's got to be trying to get the team going because he's a captain of that team. And, you know, what happened was he did an article and um, it wasn't due for release and it got released and he, I think he was just slagging everyone off. So Mick McCarthy's got every right to call him out because he's the manager of that team. I and think he was Ross one of the problems said, with him as well, Jimmy. I think Mick McCarthy was one of the problems with Key. Mick McCarthy, well, yeah. yeah, he, yeah by all accounts... They kind of used it was a bit of a piss up. Mm-hmm. So went on the international stuff, it was like him and the staff, it was like it was you know, fucking drink time, let's have a few beers, we'll train, we'll coach them, then have a night time, it's our it's our yeah. drinking time. And I think all of that, because I think it was around the time where Keane stopped drinking and everything, he kind of changed his lifestyle and everything. And I think that irritated him a little bit. So yeah, but yeah, and again, it might do, but again, he needs to voice them in, in private and the well, well, that was Keane's issue. That was Keane's issue, Jim. That was Keane's in, in the in the dressing room. Mick McCarthy made it a public thing. So and this then... is it. They called a team. They called a team meeting, and he made he called the article out and going, "What's all this then?" And then said he faked an injury. And Roy Keane being Roy Keane, he's just he's. I think he's he, he he's, you know. It's a proud man. You, you, know, you, you can't be saying fake an injury now. That would be no. like a to me personally, that'd be like a red rag to a ball, especially if it's not true. And Roy Keane wouldn't be the player that he was without that aggression and that and that desire to be the best of what of whatever he's doing. But I think he had an opportunity to go back. I think he had an opportunity to go back and he dug his ears in and said no. So for me, he's let his country down there. Um because you don't get many opportunities to play for your country, regardless of how good you are. So I think he was. I think he was wrong in doing it. I, I understand the reasons, but it doesn't mean it's right. Yeah, I. In a super quick answer, I understand where he come from. I think I'd have to play in the World Cup. Ugh. I'd probably do it to spite. I'd Mick sleep McCarthy. in a tent I'd, and play I, in the I, World I, Cup. Do you know what it is? And I would get really pissed off at the fact that he called me out as faking injury, all that stuff. I just shut shut down shop and nearly do it to spite him, and I wouldn't yeah. give him the steam off me piss again because you just I'd yeah. use that as my my driver. But look, you know me, Jim. Sometimes I've acted like an absolute helmet over something that didn't seem that important. So I'm I'm not certainly not one to, to glass houses and all that. Right, last couple of last couple of questions. Right, so uh, Alan Dodd asked a belter. Actually, I'll do that one last. Uh, another Andrew asked non uh, non footballing sporting heroes growing up. His was Sevi Ballesteros. Tank, who is yours? Mike Tyson. I was going to say Mike Tyson. Just loved him. Absolutely loved him when I was. But you were, Mike Tyson's early peak years will never be never be seen. He was just an absolute machine, an absolute freak of a fighter. And I remember could... like watching things, and you felt like he wasn't real. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Because he was only small, like one in your kind of like, how's he going to beat him? And then he just, he was just like a, a, a raging bull. And I just absolutely, it broke me heart when he got beat. It proper yeah. broke me heart. I was like, oh. it's like, it's like it's Superman. Just, you know? And then it's like, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It broke me heart. But yeah, I used to absolutely idolize Mike Tyson. What about you, Jimbo? See, I was always football, but I was never into like heroes and stuff like that. I never really. Never really bought into that, but if there was one, <laughs> it would oh, be God. the Ultimate Warrior lad. I used to love <laughs> the Ultimate Warrior. 
mate. He was unbelievable. He had the best ring entrance ever. Mate. Yeah. Yeah. I the, used to you're you're open, just come leg Jimmy, Jimmy based his makeup on him. Yeah, yeah, mate. I used to have the uh, someone made all the bands with like the dangly bits around here and like the legs. Your arms look, look like dangly bits there. Where's it? Like, <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, so you know, I used to genuinely believe that my dad was the ultimate warrior. Genuinely used to believe he looked just like him. Fuck it, that just just got out. Went went to work on the bus, come and, and turned. I never into the turned up. Warrior. That was it. That's why I thought it was the ultimate warrior because he went to work and never came home again. I did see you. <laughs> uh, right, last two. Alan Dodd. This is a cracker. I haven't even thought of, of the answer yet. But Alan Dodd asks. All three of you are stuck on a desert island. Food, water, and health is no issue. No one else on the island is around. You're there for five years, and somehow you've got a portable DVD player and batteries that don't run out. Very specific. I like that because it's essential. Uh, Great question. What one series would you each choose that you wouldn't get bored of? Tank? Easy. 24, Jack Bauer. Not even a debate. That's it. I've never even, but it, even once you've seen what? it once, though, do you, you know what's coming, though. No, no, it's the greatest. It's the greatest thing I've ever watched. Honestly, me, and, me and Sharon used to absolutely binge it. Like we were obsessed with it, obsessed with it. Then we'd watch it all. Then we bought the DVDs and went all the way back and watched the whole thing. It's the greatest TV series that's ever been made. There's not. There's no debating. Honestly, it's like Jimmy. If you've not seen it, you've got I've to. Never watch got, it. I've never tried. I've not, I've, Mate, honestly. Was... I watch a lot of series, and that's it was just quite one upset of them. when I, I found out that I wasn't going to make any more. I was, I genuinely, genuinely was upset. <laughs> Jimbo, so I've got two answers to this, and one's a, one's because it's basically asking what's your favourite series, isn't it? Yeah. So my favourite series that I would be able to watch over and over again is probably Breaking Bad. I could easily watch yeah, Breaking Bad all choice, five yeah. seasons regularly. I, I've I've gone back and watched the last season over and over quite a few times. But in my head, I'm thinking like I'm there for five years. I need some. You, you with always think of these questions in a different oh, way. Don't don't yeah. <laughs> so, it, so this is my alter, alternate answer. Friends. Friends. I know where he's coming from. With it's it, twenty it, seasons. There's about eighty episodes in each season. So you've just got the longevity, and they're always funny. So it's not like it's horrible to watch. They're just easy viewing, and you've got more of them. If I'm watching Breaking Bad, I've got five series of 10 and, uh, you know, I've got 50 episodes where on that I've got like 300 episodes to watch. I know what he means, right? Because my answer actually is quite in tune with Jimmy's way of thinking. And my answer is the royal family and the royal family, not as in the, the inbred lo- Sorry, I shouldn't say. Uh, the- <laughs> sorry, Tank. I know Alleged- you're on a royal. Allegedly. Allegedly. He loves the queen. Allegedly. Allegedly. Sorry. Uh, Tank <laughs> loves the uh, loves the queen. But, um, yeah, I, uh, I would go royal family. For the reason that I don't know why growing up back in my mum's house, I'd like come in from nights out and just put like the royal family on in the background and I'd like fall asleep to that. And there's just something about that show that reminds me of home that it's like, you know, way Barbara sits down, she's like, What do you have for tea, love? And then you all have your chat about your tea. Like it's just like my little comfort thing. So I think if I'm sat there on a desert island on my bill, I think I'd back you know, Jim Royal would make me laugh consistently no matter what. So I'm uh, I'm gonna go with that one. Um final question, and it'll have to be quick, right? Uh, and I'm just going to stay. Well, I know what Jimmy's answer is going to be already, and it's probably just going to be a laughing uh, face. Kudster wants to know, Tank, are you surprised with Jude Bellingham's decision by Liverpool to pull out of the deal, or uh, is this the usual FSG spin? And can this be a one minute answer? I'm not surprised uh, because I've been saying this for six months on this podcast that. I do not believe that FSG will spend this summer out of what they normally spend every summer. And if we haven't got the players to sell, well, then we won't be spending hundreds and two hundred millions. They've never done it. So it, it won't happen this summer. I believe Liverpool will sign one or two players this summer. That's it. You don't think it'll be the big war? Uh, Bellingham aside, which looks like it, because you were you were confident, like you were told some bits and bobs I'm that Liverpool were confident. Told the same things, and I'm Every being honest. Day, with you. Like telling me is extremely good. high up at Liverpool, and he's saying to me that but he's actually Bellingham. He's saying I'm telling you now, Bellingham may be a Liverpool player. I don't believe it. Jimmy can put as many WhatsApp messages on Twitter because I'm <laughs> saying the same thing. I don't believe Jude Bellingham will be a Liverpool player. But the more stuff what's coming out, it's actually the lads actually. Desperate to become a Liverpool player. He's mm. talking about staying at Dortmund another season to try and make the transfer happen. 
So the go fund me has time to build up so we can well, fund the transfer. <laughs> it's madness, but I don't believe that Liverpool will spend much this summer. It'll it depend if they can sell the goalkeeper for big money and other fringe players. Jimbo, you're not surprised. I think it's the right decision to to spend elsewhere because I think Jude Bellingham doesn't fix all problems. So I think I think spend elsewhere, but it depends. As I said in the last couple of podcasts, I can't see spending that much. I think to be fair, I've heard Graven back, which would be good if he can get him get him fit. He's not he's struggled at buying. I think there's some decent players out there, but I still don't think it fixes all your problems. As I said, I think you're in for a couple of seasons of pain. My issue here, and I'll keep this brief, is it's it's not Bellingham. Replace Bellingham's name with something else. It's, it's not a Bellingham thing for me. He's brilliant. Don't get me wrong. I want him. He's transformative, generational, all that good stuff. I think he's immense. I think he could be Liverpool's captain, number eight, figurehead, all that good stuff. My issue is more that we've, played this tune that we were getting Bellingham. We were putting all our eggs in the Bellingham basket for two years. We've, we've held off on other transfers because the, the the idea was that we were waiting for Bellingham. We're going to get Bellingham. So then after two years of flashing your knickers at Bellingham and doing all the donkey work with his family and all that stuff that's been going on in the background, to then turn around and go, yeah, well, the, the price is too high now. What do you mean the price is too high? You've you've known what the price is going to be roughly for two years. You've you've put other deals on the, the, the back burner in a view to making this deal happen. I just think this looks very, very poor for Liverpool Football Club. Not It's not about the player. It's more about what that shows in terms of how the club is being run. I just... I, I think they've let themselves down badly and they've put seasons on hold and you can't then not go and get the player. I think you have to get the player to set, save face. I, I decide for, aside from that, the business person in me is like, I, I think it, all, it does make sense, the business model of don't throw all your money in one player. And if you can go and get three, four, like if you said to me now we could get a Casado or McAllister and a Gravenbatch, for example, I'd snap your hand off. I, like I think that would be a, 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 a good bit of business and Mason Mount, who I'm a big fan of. I know Liverpool, some Liverpool fans won't be, but I think they all immeasurably uh, improve Liverpool. Jamie, but Mason Mount at 70 million. I'd take like, Madison over Mount if you're paying I'd have Madison million. over Mount. I'd have oh, Madison yeah, no, I agree with you there. See, but this is this is a different qu- question about the, the transfer fees of players. Like you, Casado's going to be 70, 80 million. So, they, so you're saying, all right, yeah, we won't pay 130 for Jude. Well, you're going to have to then pay 70, 80 for... So it's not going to stretch anyway. And I think it goes back to what Tank's saying there. Liverpool are going to have to sell a few players. And fans will kick off because they're like, why do we always need to sell to buy? It just looks like Liverpool can't compete. It's a it's a big, big summer for FSG. Not can't. They just won't. 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 Yeah, I think fair. it is can't, Jimmy. I, 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 I no, believe they, they can, can't, mate. The owners aren't short of a bob. They just won't. They don't play that game. For me, they're that mate who never... When it is time to go to the bar, they always nip to the toilet. They, that's, what, that's what it feels like. <laughs> uh, to be oh, fair... No, I'm generous, he, actually, lad. I'm super He's good, generous. you know. He has many, many flaws. You won't even pay we... for a flight to Dublin. He keeps putting... Mate, I'll pay for all our flights to Dublin. Not a problem. Yeah, no, <laughs> he's, he's, he's good at the old bar, is Jimbo, to be fair. He just falls asleep at half nine, though. That's yeah, the I'll, I'm, I'm there for sure. I'll, I'll, I'll pay my own, but I won't be there very long. <laughs> right, my uh, my outro to this show is going to be incredibly quick because I need to go and pick up my daughter. So uh, thank you for listening, lads. Great to see you both. Tank looks great. That's made my day. Uh, and he's still alive. There hasn't been a gas leak. So uh, lads, hope you have a brilliant rest of the week. Uh, everybody listening at home, thank you as always for your support. Please do keep it coming. Send us your feedback, any questions for the next episode. Uh, I have my mum over this weekend, so there's not going to... My mum's coming over for the weekend, so there will be no uh, live, no live show. But... Uh, that is the plan going forward, because lads, I think I'm going to retire from footy. We'll we'll I think cover you that. Need to, mate. Yeah, you I know. We'll cover that next week. We can, we'll do a do a topic on that. So that means we'll be able to do more live shows. So anyway, I'm going to shut up now. Everybody, look after yourselves. As always, thank you for your support, and we will be back with you next week on the Boot Room Podcast. All the best. Cheers, boys. Cheers, boys.